Well, it's the morning after the night before. I'm Will McPherson from the Evening Sun. We've got Mike Atherton from Sky Sports here. And we're just having a coffee and picking through the bones of another dreadful England collapse, another dreadful England test, and sadly, another dreadful Ashes tour. It ended in gruesome fashion last night. The tour from hell, it doesn't quite look like it, does it, with this the backdrop, but we've survived the tour from hell just whether the England team have, I'm barely, I'm afraid. It was a dismal viewing last night, wasn't it? Um, I mean, it was sad, really, to see the end like that. I think we've all, I've been involved in and seen many uh, England defeats, but the manner of that defeat last night was abject and was a bit sad to see. They only didn't lose 10 wickets in a session because they lost a wicket to the final ball of the second session of the day. Um, at that point, there was quite a lot of optimism about. I mean, probably anyone who's watched enough of England knows how optimism was probably misplaced. But Burns and Crawley got England off to a good start. Wood had bowled so bravely earlier in the day to limit the target to 271. And they made a decent start, and then it happened again. It did. I mean, a number of collapses on this tour, of which probably that was the worst last night. There were mitigation, mitigating circumstances because as you know, day-night test matches fluctuate and you get to that last couple of hours under lights and that's the killer time to be bowling, really. So it was always going to be a hard ass to get up to 270, but as you say, they were going well at 68 for none. I thought Burns and Crawley played like, really nicely. Um, and then that collapse after tea, there's some bad dismissals in there. You know, when you see a young player like Ollie Pope, who I think is a really good young player, and has got a lot of ability bright future ahead of him. But in the first innings, you know, he gets out defending to fifth or sixth stump, and in the second innings gets bowled behind his leg, the middle stump almost. That tells you that, you know, not all is not all is well. And then just tail enders are always going to struggle against somebody like Pat Cummings in, the, in those circumstances. But the final dismissal, Ollie Robinson was off the cut strip pretty much when he got bowled by a full toss. And there is a way to go down, and that's not the way to go down. It, the, the series ended for England in much the same way that it started, actually, with a, a batter essentially being embarrassed, bold and embarrassed. Rory Burns at the start, Ollie Robinson at the end. The, the, the problem yesterday, I suppose, wasn't that it was just an isolated collapse. It was a, it was a pattern. We can reel off gruesome stats, but England didn't make 300 in this series. No, I, and this is Australia. It's not, it, you know, I know the pitches were a little spicier than series we've seen in the past. But that is quite incredible, isn't it? It's a damning statistic. And, and I think there's a bit of denial as well. I, I was listening, you know, Joe was very, very helpful with the media. did a number of post-match interviews with British media, Australian media, and one Australian journalist out, Adam Collins, said to him the batting's brittle, and he said that's a bit unfair. It's not unfair, I'm afraid, it's, it's the truth. Um, four unbelievable collapses in the series, failing to reach 300 plus 100 uh, between them. Um, and the scores that England put on the board, you are just not going to win many test matches. Now I have to say, I've never, I've not, not come to an Ashes series in Australia before and seen as much movement off the deck as there has been. But in fact, you know, in the past, England have kind of prayed for those conditions because in 2017 it was, we can't take 20 wickets on these pitches, you know, we need a bit of help off the surface. Had four pitches here that for English seam bowlers were from heaven really. Obviously they put pressure on the batting and the batting just wasn't good enough. It wasn't a whitewash, it was one wicket from a whitewash, but it, 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 it felt in many ways worse than the two whitewashes of this century, certainly worse than the 17-18 uh, the 4-0. Can, can you explain quite why it feels so much worse? What, what the problem I think been? Um, England made Australia look a better side than they are. I think they're a very good bowling attack, relentless, and with Cameron Green adding a fourth seam who bowls at 140 plus and doesn't bowl a bad ball, that is a top class bowling attack. But I think England made Australia in the round look a better side than they are. Australia themselves have got some weaknesses in the batting and England didn't really exploit them. Think of the chances that were missed, the drop catches early on at the Gabba. 12 for 3 here, and should have been 12 for 4 with Labertain drops on North. So England have made basic mistakes in their cricket. And you can certainly argue about selection and strategy that has essentially made Australia look better than they are. And we made the point 
when we were chatting on one of these before that back in the day, if you want to go back to when I played, you know, there was a time to to rest and reset because you had games in between test matches. You don't have that now, so when that momentum starts to go against you, it's very difficult to stop. There, there is some mitigation. But England had a dreadful preparation period. They already were going to have a poor preparation period in Brisbane where they only had seven days of cricket scheduled, not all of it first class, and then it rained uh, in an almost unimaginable way uh, and, and just left them, I think, with seven sessions, uh, as well as the issues with bubble life and fatigue this year and all, all last year. But it still doesn't hide the fact that they dreadfully underperformed. Yeah, absolutely, there's mitigation. All the preparation, the lack of the rain in Queensland, uh, the lack of games against the States, meant that they got to the Gabba woefully underprepared. And I completely accept that, that that is mitigation. You can't completely just pass off the responsibility. So Joe, as you know, you were listening to Joe last night, he made some very sensible points about the structure of domestic cricket in England. But it was a bit of a, you know, pass off responsibility. And everything we heard from Ashley Giles in the last year or so has been clear lines of accountability and responsibility. That's why he gave Chris Silward the head selector's job, because he wants accountability. But there seems to be an absence of accountability now for a tour that has gone horribly wrong. If only Rory Burns had sprinted like that <laughs> yeah. on day two. Right? <laughs> um, there's an appetite, obviously, after a defeat like this, for, for heads to roll, for you know, heads on a spike, and players to be dropped, uh, coaches to lose their jobs. You've written in the Times this morning. Um, who you think? How what, how you think things should be from here? Who, who would you do? You, do you think well, like, a, a sort of clear out is required? There can't be no change. Again, you know, you, you have to separate what are systemic problems. Uh, and no doubt there are, and, and those are deep-seated, and maybe there'll be a bit of change there. But then you also have to take responsibility for mistakes made on tour. So I don't think you can come away from a, a tour like this when it has gone like that and say, well, it's all going to be fine, we'll just carry on with the same people. Now, of course, there's, in terms of the captain, there's a, a real dearth of alternatives, and he seems to have the support of the ECB. Um, obviously, you've got more alternatives when you get into the managerial and coaching roles, so Chris Silverwood and Ashley Giles. So I would find it inconceivable that there's not going to be any change. Um, but it may not happen immediately because Ashley has to send in his report, and Strauss is in charge of reading that and making recommendations. But there has to be some change after that. This being the England team, they're playing again in a little over a month in the Caribbean. Uh, so we potentially have this strange situation where both decisions aren't made quite quickly enough and they, they're playing again and, you know, pe people are it's still in their jobs. It, is, that, is that an acceptable situation? Well, it's a, it's a reflection on the, on the scheduling and, and that's the way cricket is at the moment. I, I, I really do think England played too much and there needs to be a bit of a reset in terms of, of scheduling and the amount that the cricketers are playing and the T20 boys are, are in action in what, six or seven days time I think and then it's a month to the three tests in, in the Caribbean so whether England will have some caretaker positions um, around that Caribbean tour who knows because when you're making change you have to make sure that it's the right change and you're just not, not a knee jerk and, and rushed job so that you, you may have a caretaker situation before then um, I can't see you know, the way that ended there was a damning reflection on the coaching and managerial positions around the team. Because players who have respect for captains and coaches don't go down like that, so there has to be some change. Joe Root, as you mentioned, uh, kind of took aim at county cricket last night. I think he is among a group of England players who feel that they don't arrive at test matches any better prepared for having played a few county games. He averaged 36 in the championship last year and 60 in test cricket, minus Labuschagne averages 60 odd in test cricket, he averaged 30 something. Travis Head, who was so brilliant in this series, averaged 18 for Sussex last year. Um, do you, do, do, does do Joe's comments chime true with you? Yeah, I think everybody um, thinks that, well, certainly most people who've played county cricket would like to see Red Bull first class cricket played at the right time of year, but the, to, for the quality to be as high as possible on the best possible surfaces. Um, you know, 
it's not rocket science, is it? You want a, you want a good flow of talent into the county game. You want the standard of first class cricket to be as close to Test cricket as possible, with Lions providing a bridge uh, for that gap. And you want the coaching and management of the team to be as, as top class as possible. And that's really the three areas that you're looking to get right. And no doubt that yeah, it's been tricky in the last couple of years with COVID, the change to conferences, and all, for all the reasons we understand. But I think there's an appetite to see a higher quality first class competition played at the right time of year on the best possible surfaces. Is, is a looming question whether that remains a county competition with 18 teams, do you think? Or is that, is well, that too much? I, I mean, I'm not sure there's an appetite uh, to, to, to cull. I, I don't see that appetite in the game, so you, you, you have, to have to work how you do it, whether you go to three divisions of six or whatever. But um, a, 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 a condensed, high-quality, first-class competition is an absolute essential if you're going to have a smaller gap between domestic cricket and test cricket. Just as an ultimate question, Mark Wood possibly the only England player to advance his reputation? Yeah, not tour? many enhanced their reputation, did they? But Mark Wood yesterday morning bowled brilliantly in his career best figures, best figures by an England bowler in Australia for a generation, for 15 years. Bowled with great hostility and spirit throughout. Uh, and Australian crowds took to him because they saw a, a, a real trier there, a battler. Uh, and he was thrilled that he got reward at the end. He deserved to get those wickets for the performances earlier in the series. Any other positives? Um, not many, Will. No, <laughs> other than the fact that the sun is shining in Hobart. We're at the harbour side. The Henry Jones Hotel over there, which is, which is lovely, where I once met Leonard Cohen, believe it or not. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, England have okay. lost their last three series in Australia, in the, you know, 5 0, 4 0, 4 0, their 13, from, 13 defeats from 15, also coincides when I started watching in Australia. I don't think it's down to me, but <laughs> who, who knows? Are they as far away as they've ever been? Do you see it? Do you have any hope for four, coming back four years' time and seeing England win? Well, I do have hope because I've, I've seen England win here all 2010 11. It has happened. Uh, English cricket has always produced good players and I hope will always produce good players um, and and things do turn but you need to kind of grasp the nettle they don't turn by themselves um, so but I think when you have a, a defeat like this which I, you, know, you can liken way back to 1999 when we lost to New Zealand at home that, that you then get an appetite to, to turn things around so hopefully some good will come out of it we shall see. Well, that's all from Hobart, where it's been a pretty grisly tour for England. But uh, thank you for watching, and uh, see you soon.